In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear faithful, as we continue our story of the history of the society, we arrive today at a very critical moment in our story. We arrive today at the 30th of June, 1988, to an event which has been called Operation Survival. This was the, the date on which the Archbishop, together with Bishop de Castro Meyer, consecrated four bishops to continue the work of the society, to continue the ordination of traditional priests, and to continue the work of tradition, which the society uh, represents. And it is a good name, Operation Survival, because had the Archbishop not done this, it is, it is pretty much certain that none of us would be here today attending this Mass. It really was that critical as we see the, the history of the society unfold after this event. It is true that all of us are here today because of what the Archbishop did on the 30th of June, 1988. Now this step, which was so dramatic when it finally came, was something that the Archbishop had been considering for many years. In fact, even from the earliest days of the society's history, the Archbishop had to confront this question of what would happen if the, if the crisis in the church were prolonged, if it continued to get worse, if there was no end in sight, what must he do? What should he do? Where did his duty lie in providing for a future for the, the tradition within the church and for the souls who so badly needed it. So this was something in, in the back of his mind. If the crisis were to last beyond his lifetime, what did duty demand from him as an archbishop? In 1981, as far as I know, it was the first time in 1981 that the archbishop spoke publicly on this question. And he said that yes, if the crisis were to get worse, if providence were to give the, the necessary indications, he would consecrate bishops to carry on the work of tradition. It was, in fact, by then, something that was a bit in the minds of a lot of people. The Archbishop tells a story that he was once approached by an Australian man who told him, Your Grace, I would like to enter your seminary to be trained by you as a priest, but, you know, in six years, you're going to be dead anyway. So what's the point? So we, we have there, uh, let's say, the characteristic uh, national bluntness of the Australian character. But it, it's quite true. And the Archbishop uh, took that very much to heart, uh, together with what he could tell from, from the, the seminarians he already had. He used to joke that the seminarians of Econ they would tremble whenever he coughed because they, they were desperately hoping and praying that he would live long enough to ordain them. In 1983, the Archbishop called a meeting of the superiors of the society to discuss this question. So you see it had moved, moved on to a certain, uh, a certain importance in the Archbishop's mind that it had to be formally considered and discussed by the superiors of the society in 1983. Nothing was decided at that meeting. It remained an open question. And the Archbishop continued to, to wait, to think, uh, and to see the signs of providence. The first sign of that providence was in 1986 with the, the famous uh, prayer meeting, the meeting of world religious leaders at Assisi, which was a great uh, scandal to the Catholic world, to the Catholic mind. For the Archbishop, that was one sign of the gravity of the crisis, that it was continuing to get worse, that it wasn't going to end anytime soon. Somewhat less well known was the second sign of providence, which came the following year, 1987, 
In that year, Rome replied to a, a document called the, the, the Dubia, a document that the Archbishop had submitted to Rome with his uh, arguments, with his doubts about the, the doctrine of religious liberty, which is taught by the Second Vatican Council and, and certainly afterwards. He submitted his arguments, very strong arguments, as to why this doctrine of religious liberty is not conformed with the tradition of the church. And just a brief explanation there. The religious liberty as a, as a doctrine says that the, the, the governments of the world are meant to be neutral in matters of religion. It has this strange idea that somehow the leaders of, of, of the world governments are not able to discern truth in religious matters. And so the, the government has a, it's normal, it's the normal order of things, the intended order of things by God, that governments be neutral. And of course, this is not at all the mind of the church. The church teaches that the, the true religion founded by Jesus Christ is uh, recognizable with the help of the grace of God, of course, but is recognizable by all men. And all men have a responsibility to embrace the truth of Christ's religion and to follow it and to put it into practice in their lives. It is not the order intended by God that governments are somehow dispensed from the responsibility of, of organizing their countries and governing their citizens according to the precepts of the gospel. They, they do precisely have that duty. So obviously in practice, as we can see, this, this secularization of government brings a whole train of problems in its wake because if the government is free to to chart its own course without reference to the gospel of Jesus Christ well then why can't there be divorce why can't that be legal etc uh, etc et why 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 should we teach religion in in public schools which which always was the practice in catholic countries at least to teach religion in public schools to teach the Catholic religion. But if the state is meant to be secular, well, then it, what follows is a secularization of, of society. So in any case, Rome responds to the archbishop's document with the following uh, statement. Religious liberty is unquestionably a novelty, which is nevertheless in full conformity with the tradition of the church. So the archbishop sees what is quite obviously a contradiction in this, uh, in this reply from Rome. And for him, this was extremely significant. The, the a book that you know probably very well, they have uncrowned him. This is a book the archbishop writes at this time because uh, of this reply from Rome. And this was the second sign of providence that the archbishop considered very significant. And so at the ordination sermon in June of that year, June of 1987, he says that providence seems to be giving him the signs that he needs. So it's a real warning that this consecration of bishops is likely to happen. Rome learns of this statement of the archbishop and Rome is extremely nervous and it doesn't take time at all, any time at all. It only takes about two weeks for Rome to approach the archbishop in order to begin a series of negotiations to, uh, to see what can be worked out, if you will. And what follows is an entire year of negotiations with Rome on this question of the consecration of bishops. Obviously, we cannot go into all of those details. Um, the key point that I will say, though, is that during this whole year of negotiation and discussion, what the archbishop is trying to discern is the following. Are the Roman authorities and the society entering into these discussions with similar goals? The archbishop did, did not really think they were approaching the discussions with similar theological principles. That's quite obvious from the meeting at Assisi and from the reply to the archbishop's dubia. That, that would have been a complete naive perspective for the archbishop to have. It wasn't a question about whether they had the same theological principles. It's obvious that they did not. 
But did they have the same goals, at least as far as these discussions were concerned? And in the archbishop's mind, the goals of these two discussions, the, the goal of the resolution of these discussions would be to express the society's Catholic character. The, the society had been, uh, had been slandered for years as being schismatic, as being revolutionary, and the archbishop was extremely happy for the chance to, to express in a concrete way what he had already expressed so many times, that we do not have a schismatic spirit, that we are Catholics, that we do want to be submitted to the Pope. So, at the one, on the one hand, to express the society's Catholic spirit, but at the same time, second goal, to allow the society the ability to live its Catholic life, to protect the society, to allow the society to, to live according to the traditions of the church. So, goal one, to express the society's character, but goal number two, to protect the society so that it could actually live its Catholic character. So these are the two goals in the mind of the Archbishop. Does Rome share those goals? In December of 1987, a good statement by the Archbishop, which I think expresses very well what his perspective was, December 1987, if Rome really wants to give us true autonomy, like we have now, but with our submission, we would like to be submitted to the Holy Father, and we have always wished for it. If Rome agrees to let us try this experiment of tradition, there will no longer be any problem." Unquote. So halfway through this uh, year of discussions, the Archbishop makes this statement, which expresses very well his perspective on, on what these discussions are all about. But is that what Rome wants? That's the question. Or is Rome's goal merely to gain leverage over the society so as to eventually transform it into just another Novus Ordo institution? That is to say, another religious institution, another congregation with a Novus Ordo mindset which is, which is advancing the revolution in the church. Is that what Rome wants? Now, what does become very clear as the negotiations drag on, is that Rome is desperately trying to avoid giving the society its own bishop. That becomes very clear. Rome wants the society to have to depend on diocesan bishops for its ordinations and confirmations. Because it becomes clear that that is Rome's goal, Rome's preference, because every time the Archbishop brings up this question of society bishops, Rome sidesteps it, puts it off. Well, you know, that's something that could be considered later. It may or may not be necessary. Let's first talk about these other things, etc., etc. Every time the Archbishop raises this question, those who are uh, representing uh, the, the Vatican sidestep and delay that question. Nevertheless, the Archbishop tries to keep it in the forefront of the discussions. On the 3rd of May, the 3rd of May, 1988, the Archbishop submits names for candidates, potential candidates to be consecrated. So these are priests of the society to be consecrated as bishops. He submits those names for Rome's consideration. Nevertheless, two days later, on the 5th of May, the Archbishop signs what is called the Protocol of the 5th of May, 1988. And this was a document that was supposed to guarantee the survival of the society as well as to express its Catholic character. This is the document which is resolving this situation, this unusual situation between the society and the Vatican authorities. The Archbishop does put his signature to that document. Now, what does that document say about this crucial question of the society having its own bishops? I'll quote from that document. It says, quote, the consecration of a member of the society as a bishop appears useful. And it continues that 
the, those who are representing the Vatican, it continues, will suggest to the Holy Father that he name a bishop chosen from within the society presented by Archbishop Lefebvre. That's as far as it goes. It, it says that it, it, it appears useful that a member of the society be a bishop, and we who represent the Vatican, we will go back to Rome and we will suggest to the Holy Father that this be done. Now that night, the night of the 5th of May, the 6th of May, the Archbishop does not sleep. He is continuously brought back to this point that after a year of discussions, a year of him trying to, because remember the whole discussions began because the Archbishop said, I'm gonna consecrate bishops to continue the work of tradition. That was the whole, uh, the whole catalyst for the discussions beginning. And after a year of discussions, there's still no guarantee that the society will have its own bishops. And so during that night, the Archbishop writes a letter to Cardinal Ratzinger, who is representing the Vatican at these discussions. And in that letter, he does not reject the protocol. That's an important point. Some have said that he did. That's clearly not the case. He does not reject the protocol. He simply adds an additional provision, a practical provision. He asks that the Pope guarantee permission for a consecration of bishops on the 30th of June. He asks for a guarantee from the Pope on this point. And for the Archbishop, this is a test of Rome's good faith. I should mention that during this year of discussions, there were occasional, uh, occasional points which came up which caused the Archbishop concern. For example, uh, at one point, Cardinal Ratzinger, he made some comment that, you know, Your Grace, after this situation is resolved, it would be normal, for example, let us say at the Society's Church in Paris, that the Novus Ordo Mass would be offered, oh, you know, once a week or so. The Archbishop, of course, did not agree to that. But it's interesting, there were occasional comments, even during this year of discussions, which gave the Archbishop a certain sense of the context in which Rome was trying to sidestep and delay the question of bishops. And so he wants this promise from the Pope uh, as, a, as a proof of Rome's good faith. Again, it, is, it has been said by some that the Archbishop wrote to Cardinal Ratzinger the next day because he realized that he had to reject the protocol because he had inadvertently somehow compromised on the faith. The protocol was a compromise on the faith and so he had to, to reject it. He did not reject it and certainly the Archbishop never thought that he had compromised on the faith as if the Archbishop was not intelligent enough to recognize a compromise on the faith before he would sign the document. But the Archbishop explicitly said afterwards, and again, I will quote him, he describes the protocol as, quote, good in itself, it is acceptable. If it were not, I would not have signed it in the first place, that is sure, unquote. So it's not that the Archbishop realized that he had compromised on the faith, it's that the Archbishop was, was realizing better and better the implications of this omission, of this omission of any lack of a, of a guarantee of a bishop. So now some time intervenes while Rome uh, discusses the, uh, this, this new element that the Archbishop has, has introduced. And the, the Archbishop uses that time on the 30th of May he calls a meeting with the leaders of the various traditional Catholic congregations that are uh, the allies, we might say, of the society, part of the family of, of tradition, Benedictines and, and Dominicans and Carmelites, etc. The Archbishop calls a meeting of the superiors of those congregations, and he wants to discuss what should we do if Rome does not agree, if Rome does not guarantee us a bishop, what should we do? I must uh, somewhat humbly admit that at this meeting, opinion was divided among the priests, the priests who were present representing these various congregations. To, to, to my, my, my embarrassment, I must admit that uh, opinion was not divided among the sisters. 
and that is uh, to, to their credit, I think. So the, uh, the Dominican sisters, the Carmelite sisters, the, the sisters of the Society of St. Pius X, they were very much unanimous on this question that we must have a bishop uh, with Rome's permission or without it in order to be safely carrying on our work of tradition. During that very meeting, the Archbishop receives word from Rome that Rome has rejected all of the candidates that the Archbishop had suggested as being future bishops. Rome had rejected all of them. And therefore, the Archbishop decides that Rome is not serious. Rome is not serious about protecting the work of tradition that the society represents. And so the society will go ahead in any case with what is required for the protection of souls and the work of tradition. Now, as we know, after the consecrations, Rome claimed that the archbishop had committed a schismatic act by, by consecrating these four bishops. Now, it's obviously not true, but it, it, does, it does call for a certain comment what is ironic, and this is a bit of a footnote, if you will, what, what is ironic is that Rome thinks that the mere consecration of bishops con it constitutes a schismatic act because of Rome's belief in this new idea of collegiality. Because normally to, to, to consecrate a bishop without the Pope's approval, unusual though that be, and normally forbidden as, as that is, it, it's not enough to be schismatic. To be schismatic requires setting up a kind of parallel church to, to pretend that these, these bishops that you're consecrating have authority in the church. That would be a schismatic act. But what's, what's ironic is that it is this, this novelty, this error of collegiality, which uh, is, is a Vatican II invention by which, by the mere fact of being a bishop, a bishop has a certain authority in the church. That's, that's the doctrine of collegiality, that the church is somehow uh, a parliament of bishops. And so by the mere fact of being a bishop, you have a certain governing authority in the church, which is not the church's traditional doctrine at all. But it's interesting to see and ironic that it's, it's Rome being tripped up by its own erroneous theology, which makes them think that the archbishop's act is schismatic. But by no traditional understanding of schism is this a schismatic act because the archbishop is not setting up a parallel church. He's not pretending that his bishops have any authority in the church. And he was as clear as clear could be on that point. So by no traditional uh, understanding of schism is this a schismatic act. That's one little footnote. Of course, Rome, after the consecrations, Rome excommunicates the archbishop because he, he, uh, because he committed this, this act. And that also uh, demands a little comment. It's, it's certainly true. No one would ever deny that consecrating a bishop without the Pope's approval is normally not allowed. It's normally a very serious, uh, it's a very serious crime even to, to, to consecrate a bishop without the Pope's approval. This is not normal and everyone knows that. Okay. However, the, an excommunication is a punishment which the church gives for certain grave sins, not for all grave sins, obviously, but for certain grave sins, it is a punishment that the church imposes. But the society made this point, and, and this is why the society never recognized the excommunication, is because it was not a grave sin what the archbishop did, not in this context, because what Rome was actually asking the archbishop to do in the concrete, not in the abstract, but in the concrete, in the real circumstances, what Rome was asking the archbishop to do was to abandon the souls that were protected by the society so that those souls could be swept into the modernist current that was destroying the church and destroying souls. That's concretely 
what Rome was asking the archbishop to do. So this disobedience to the Pope was not real. It was apparent, but it was not real because in certain circumstances, we have to obey God rather than men. I will also point out another little footnote, if you will, the, in 2009, Rome withdrew the excommunications, again, which we never recognized in any case, but they withdrew the excommunications of our four bishops in 2009, which is interesting because it's an implicit recognition that this, this was not a schismatic act because you can't withdraw an excommunication from someone who's in schism. Schism is itself an excommunicatable offense. So you can't withdraw an excommunication from someone who's in schism. So in 2009, there is an implicit admission by Rome that the, the act of, of, of consecration of bishops was not schismatic. Another little footnote. Now, to conclude our, our sermon today, I, I'd like to, to point out a certain way of describing this situation in which the Archbishop found himself, which I think is not correct, and I think we want to get a little clarity on this point. It is often said that the Archbishop was placed in a dilemma of either choosing faith or obedience. That was the dilemma that was confronting the Archbishop. And, and I understand, superficially speaking, why people describe this situation in that way, superficially speaking. However, it is important for us to know and, and to understand correctly that there can never really be a conflict between the demands of the faith and the demands of true obedience. Because what the virtue of obedience really demands in any concrete situation is never opposed to the faith. If, if it was, then we would be in place in impossible situations. And there is no such thing. There is, in every situation, the will of God to be followed. And so what is really demanded by one virtue is always reconcilable with what is really demanded by another virtue. And that's important for us to grasp. It is precisely by the light of faith that we understand in any situation where our true obligation of obedience lies. Because it is by the light of faith that we understand the nature of authority, especially church authority, the limits of authority, the purpose of authority, etc. So it's by the light of faith that we are able to discern where the obligation of obedience truly lies. And that's very important for us to understand. And it is by the faith also that we know that sometimes we must obey God rather than men. It's a, it's a direct quote from, from the Acts of the Apostles. That is clearly a very, very delicate thing to do. To be placed in such a situation is always a very delicate and I would even say dangerous position to be in. Because how easy it would be, of course, how easy it would be to follow our own will, to follow our own agenda, and to justify it by saying that, well, I must obey God rather than men. It is a very, very dangerous and delicate thing to do. Nevertheless, nevertheless, if we admit what is quite obviously a Catholic principle, that all authority comes from God, and that men have their authority delegated from God, and that men can fail, men can abuse their authority, so that sometimes it is necessary to obey God rather than men, and that is the will of God, and that is the virtuous path. If we admit that principle, which is clearly a Catholic principle, well, there are going to be extraordinary situations, extraordinary crises, where we are going to have to obey God rather than men. And it is, it is humility and it is courage to do what is necessary in those situations. 
in a time of crisis, in an extraordinary situation, as delicate as that discernment may be, the necessity of making that discernment is inescapable. It is inescapable. I will also, and we will close with this, I will point out that historically speaking, we see how events played out following 1988. It is interesting, tragic, but interesting to see that the consecration of these bishops was a, a point of departure, a point of separation between some of those who had been consistent and faithful to the, the, the principles of the society, and which are, we hope, <laughs> just the principles of the church, not our own principles. But it was a point of departure, a point of separation between the society and, and certain people. Those who did not accept the archbishop's decision, who no longer continued to, to work with the society, some priests obviously left the society because of this event, it was a point of departure, not just, let us say, concretely in their not belonging to the society anymore, but at the level of principle. And it's interesting because it didn't need to be that way. It didn't need to be that way. This decision that the archbishop made was a very delicate one. We can see that. He took his time. He knew that he was, he was making a decision that was going to impact souls for years, our souls, those of us here today. And that was very serious business. The Archbishop took his time. So it is possible that those who felt the Archbishop had made the wrong decision on this one question, nevertheless could have kept all of the right principles. That's possible. There's no reason why that could not have been. We disagree with the Archbishop on this particular decision, but obviously we, we, we continue to accept all of the traditional principles, the, the understanding of the crisis of the church for what it is. They could have kept all of that. It's also possible that in the years that followed, as, as events bore out the wisdom and the appropriateness and the necessity of the archbishop's decision, it, it would have been possible for these people later on to say, oh, you know what, that was the right decision. As so many have, I would say, as so many priests and even bishops today have come to see the archbishop's decision as correct and have even then, let's say, moved to adopt the, the understanding of the crisis of the church that the society has. We, we see priests and bishops doing that since 1988. But for those who did not accept the decision in 1988, the fact is that they have never accepted it since. And more tragically, and again, this was not necessary, but it is how it played out historically, they have changed their principles or their understanding of the crisis in the church. They have either changed their principles by saying that obedience to the Pope is something that is necessary at all times, no matter what, which is clearly not true, but nevertheless, they, their principles have become distorted on that point, or while keeping the, the principles, the correct principles, they have changed their understanding of the crisis to say, well, the crisis is not so bad. And so while we accept in, in theory that it may be necessary to disobey the Pope in certain circumstances, this is not it because the crisis is not that bad. It didn't have to be that way. But that is how it has played out, very sadly, for those who did not accept the Archbishop's decision on this point. So we will leave it there for today. We have to thank the Archbishop and, of course, thank God, who provides, of course, the Archbishop with the grace he needed to make this decision, the courage, the humility, the, the prudence to make this decision, which has enabled us to be here today. We have to to ask God as well for the grace to be faithful to the Archbishop's legacy, which of course the Archbishop will be the first to say it's not his legacy. It's merely, it's merely a question of fidelity to the church, to its, to its dogmas, to its moral life, 
and, and to its liturgy. So we have to pray to God that we may continue to use the gifts, the treasures that we only have because of the Archbishop's courageous decision on the 30th of June, 1988. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.